is my pleasure and honor to introduce to you this evening Professor Miroslav Wolf, who will deliver the 2013 Regis College Chancellor's Lecture titled Life Worth Living, The Christian Faith and the Crisis of Humanities. Professor Wolf is the Henry B. Wright Professor of Systematic Theology at Yale Divinity School and founding director of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. He also regularly teaches and lectures in Central and Eastern Europe and in Asia. Born in Croatia, he earned a BA in philosophy and classical Greek from the University of Zagreb and theology from Zagreb's Evangelical Theological Seminary with a thesis on Ludwig Farbach. He also earned an MA from Fuller Theological Seminary, Pasadena, California, and a doctorate in theology from the University of Tübingen under the supervision of Jürgen Moltmann. Professor Wolf is the author of 16 books with topics ranging from theological meditations on the work of the Bosnian poet Alexa Santik, A Theology of Work, The Theology of Jürgen Moltmann, Reconciliation, Trinity, Interfaith Dialogue, especially between Muslims and Christians, and also Public Faith and the Common Good. Of note regarding his publications are free of charge, giving and forgiving, and a culture stripped of grace in 19, 2000, sorry, 2006. This was the Archbishop of Canterbury Lenten book for that same year. After our likeness, the church as the image of Trinity in 1998 was the winner of the Christianity Today Book Award and Exclusion and Embrace a theological exploration of identity, otherness, and reconciliation, published in 1996, was the 2002 winner of the prestigious Grohlmeyer Award in Religion. Exclusion and Embrace was also named by Christianity Today as one of the 100 most influential books of the 20th century. A member of the Episcopal Church in the United States and the Evangelical Church in Croatia, Professor Wolf has been involved in international ecumenical and interfaith dialogue, including the Vatican's Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity. He is on the executive board of C1 World Dialogue, whose mission is to promote peace between Western and Islamic cultures and he is an active participant in the Global Agenda Council on Values of the World Economic Forum. He has also served as an advisor for the White House Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships for several years. He also co-taught a course on globalization with former British Prime Minister Tony Blair. Professor Wolf is a frequent commentator on religious and cultural issues on popular media outlets, including CNN, NPR, National Public Radio, and the Al Jazeera Television Network. Please join me in welcoming Professor Miroslav Wolf. Thank you for this to the invitation to be here to deliver this lecture. Um, what I decided to speak on is to give you, so to speak, a rationale for a course that I will teach starting this coming January at Yale College and the project in which I am involved that will support that course. The title of that course is Life Worth Living. Why life worth living? That's what I want to answer 
in this lecture today. Why do we need to address anew this question? And in particular, what kind of challenges does it offer and, and uh, provide for us doing so in the context of university education? Of course, the question of life worth living stands at the very heart of the Christian faith, it stands at the heart of world faiths, it stands at the heart of great philosophies. And yet, this is the main thesis of what I'm going to say, and yet it has dropped off, so to speak, from the curricula of our great universities. One of my missions in the remaining days of my life <laughs> is to retrieve uh, this question, to put it back to the center of our engagement. And this lecture is a kind of justification of that project. And the way in which I want to approach this, um, uh, this topic is by having a conversation with a very good friend of my book, of a very good friend of mine from uh, Yale University, Sterling Professor of Law by the name of Anthony Kronman. Um, the title of his book is Education's End, Why Our Colleges and Universities Have Given Up on the Meaning of Life. Education's End, the title suggests itself, is, um, is ambiguous. <laughs> It's about education which is failing to reach its proper end and therefore, even though it seems to be thriving, it's in a, in a sense at its own end. And education, he thinks, at the major universities is failing because it's failing to ask the great questions of life. It's failing to ask the question, how do we succeed, not in this or that endeavor that we undertake, but how do we succeed as human beings? What does it mean to succeed as human beings? Now, Tony Cronman, he sketches the development of engagement in this question, especially in American universities. Um, Harvard, when it was founded as uh, the great, uh, presently great uh, American university, the ends of human uh, living were not merely a fit subject of exploration. This was what primarily, at that time, education was all about. And even what he calls in the second phase of the development of at least American higher education, North American higher, uh, <laughs> United States higher education, um, after, um, in the second half of the 19th century, when it ended up being organized more around secular humanism, even then, it was a very important question. So important, in fact, that presidents of universities would give lectures on the meaning of life, courses on the meaning uh, of life. That's what organized, it was a pivoting ground which the whole of studies was organized. That changed, um, Tony Cronman suggests, and especially changed, and now some of you will bristle at that idea, and I bristle a little bit at it uh, myself, and I take a little bit different course than he does, but I think in some ways he's still right. He changed in 69, he says. In this third phase, the question of meaning of life ceased to be a recognized and valued subject of instruction in the humanities. And there are two basic developments that he sketches why this happened. First development happened is um, kind of the stress, uh, the stress on sciences in the universities. Uh, sciences, of course, do not ask the question of the meaning of life. They don't ask the question of the purpose of life. They ask the question of how different aspects, so to speak, of the world function. Right? that their, 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 their purpose is explanatory rather than to give uh, account of the purposes of human existence. Now, obviously, sciences are a very, very important part of our 
um, scholarly endeavor and hardly anybody that I know would want to somehow to push the scientific endeavor back. In fact, we are benefiting immensely from the work that sciences, hard sciences and a little bit softer sciences are, are doing. What uh, Anthony Cronman suggests is happened is because of the high reputation of sciences, hard sciences, humanities have started adjusting their own methodologies so that they would have also this scientific reputation. And in the process of adjusting the methodologies of humanities, of study of humanities, to fit more the so-called so scientific method, what is lost is what is most important in the humanities. And roughly what is lost, he suggests, is the room for the great conversations with um, writers, great thinkers of the past, as if these thinkers were actually our contemporaries and each other's contemporaries. The great conversation falls off. We end up studying Plato, situating Plato in the particularities of his time, his questions, and Plato ends up more and more staying there rather than somehow being also a conversation partner for us. And so it happens also with other great thinkers of, um, from, the, from the past. Um, that's one of the reasons for the demise of uh, on the crisis of humanities. The second one is, is a little bit more controversial. And he suggests that that's the, the reason for it is the culture of what he calls and what is often called political correctness. I'm not utterly persuaded about it. He thinks political correctness, multiculturalism are um, one of the basic, basic problems. And what he suggests happens uh, with the stress of political correctness and multiculturalism is kind of devaluation of the question of right living because we farm it out, we assume that every individual community, every group, indeed every person is kind of a master of his or her own faith, makes decision about what it makes up for a good life for them. And once you make this move, that's him suggesting, uh, you end up actually not having really to have a very significant conversation about this issue. Now, I, I, I argue with him about this issue. I sometimes think that multiculturalism, to the contrary, raises the question of, uh, uh, of alternative compelling accounts of, of, uh, of right living rather than simply suppress them. What instead I think is going on is that uh, we have been witnessing kind of twofold movement, which I think uh, the, is, is connected. And one has to do with uh, a kind of disappearance from at least the humanities, the sense of that there is such a thing as human nature. And here I build on especially Terry Eagleton's little book. Some of you, if you haven't read it, I suggest that you read it. It's, it's a kind of fast-paced uh, or reading, uh, very helpful, I believe. He suggests that uh, in much of today's, uh, today's um, uh, uh, kind of uh, academic intellectual climate um, in the humanities, there is a sense that no, there is no such a thing as humanity or human life to be contemplated. If that is true, my apologies, I have come down with the cold. And so um, I'm sometimes hot and I'm sometimes cold. And uh, thank you very much for, uh, for this. Uh, you're witnessing a hot face. <laughs> <laughs> now, if that's true that we don't, have, that we don't operate with something like a human, human nature, then we, if we really cannot explore what it would mean to flourish as human beings, but only what it, might what it would mean to live authentically as particular individuals. And you can see how kind of a deep conversation then falls aside. It ends up being a conversation about my own sense and sensibilities, maybe informed by what other people are saying, but it, is, uh, it loses something of, uh, of, of kind of intensity, that conversation. 
Now, the second thing I think is even more, more, from my perspective, much more significant. And I will discuss it under the rubric of preferences. Basically, I think what's happened is that in contemporary culture, we have reduced more and less the questions about what makes life worth living to a matter of preference. The way we make decisions about consumer goods, roughly, not exactly, but roughly, that's the way we tend to think about making decisions about what makes life worth living. Now, we speak, for instance, of religious preferences. And preferences belong to the language of consumerist culture. It doesn't, they don't belong to the language of deep and informed commitments, and certainly not to the language of ways of living that matter more than life itself. Preferences are not informed by prayer, in prayerful, not formed in prayerful contemplation through careful reading of sacred texts, through judicious processes of considering options in a great conversation spanning cultures. They merge as blend of incohate longings and calculations of benefits directed by sleek and cleverly advertised goods. You don't need to discuss, read Socrates or Spinoza Buddha or Jesus, or anybody to figure out what your preferences are. You listen to your gut, and you read consumer reports. <laughs> you want to make intelligent choices, right? <laughs> and I think that conceptualization of ways of living one's own life as preference makes us stop, really, to a great conversation about what makes life truly worth living. We, don't, we cannot explore with intellectual vigor what makes life worth living and values that guide us in life if we abandon, if we, if we adopt this sphere, uh, if we adopt preference as a major mode of expressing this. We need to abandon the sphere of preferences and in fact think of the values what, that guide us not so much as preferences but as reflexive standards on the basis of which we make our choices and which we make our preference, have our preferences. Now what happens when the great question of what makes life worth living drops off the university discussion? Universities, I think, and that's maybe a controversial thesis, universities devolve. That's the controversial part, right? That's the passionate part. That's my proposal. You'll resist it, maybe. Universities devolve, I think, to basically research institutes and vocational schools. They try to explain how the world is made up, right? at varieties of levels, from subatomic particles to um, astrophysics, and everything that's then in between. And they help us also figure out how do we get from point e A to point B. Right? They're involved in so-called instrumental rationality. They explain and they provide us instrument to achieve our own ends. But I want to suggest that one of the most signature questions of human beings is not how. How's world configured? How does world function? How can I put world and this little portion of the world in which I am to my own uses? I think that the most signature question for human beings is more to what end? To what end do I seek to adv advance knowledge? To what end do I invent new technologies? To what end do I work from dawn to dusk, whatever my jobs are? 
Now, centered on research and vocational training, universities are about cognition and instrumental rationality only, not about moral norms and meanings. They teach students how to achieve whatever ends they themselves or others set for them, but not how to evaluate and choose wisely among possible ends. Expert in means, we then remain amateurs in ends, in goals, in purposes. With cognitive and instrumental prowess, we blindly follow our preferences, bereft of reflexive standards or norms with which to evaluate them. We seek to satisfy our desires without exploring what is genuinely desirable. And I think that idea of exploration of what is desirable rather than what just is desired is what I think humanistic humanities ought to be about. I think fundamentally that's what religious traditions are about. I think fundamentally that's certainly also what Christian faith is about. It gives an account of who we are as human beings. It situates us in an account of reality and then asks the question, well, who is the self? What should our social relations be? And what good should we pursue? It's no accident that Jesus mentioned dual command as a summary of his whole teaching. You should love, you should desire, and then it tells you what should you desire, what should you love. You should love God with all your heart. You should love neighbor as yourself. So it's really a form of shaping of our desire rather than instrument of simply satisfying the desires. Right? In Plato's dialogue, Georges, Callicles, an advocate of natural rights of the strong against the weak. It's kind of, he's kind of a, a proto-Nietzsche there if you read that dialogue. It almost sounds like that. Derides Socrates for doing philosophy. In response, Socrates tells him, there is no nobler inquiry, Callicles, than that to which, than that, than that which you censure me for making. What ought the character of a man and a woman be, and what his or her pursuits? What's the character of us? And what ought to be our pursuits? But even Callicles, a man of action out to satisfy his appetites, concedes that the youth who neglects philosophy is an inferior man and will never aspire to anything great or noble. Callicles' judgment, judgment may have been too harsh, but not by much. When universities give up reflecting on teaching on the meaning of life, they fail their students because they withhold from them the noblest of all inquiries. That's what happens when universities become uh, research institutes and vocational schools. The second problem I think that emerges is that I think that in the globalized world, with multiple communities and faiths living together and living under the same roof, each guided by alternative visions of a good life. If we in universities don't have a ways of reflecting about what makes life worth living and engaging in conversation about it, we will not be able to engage in a public conversation about futures and purposes that our public life ought to take. So universities are heirs of the morally serious Socrates, but when it comes to the exploration of life worth living, they have fallen below the level of the appetites satisfying Callicles. 
Universities are also heirs of Christian faith's search for understanding, but they have abandoned the pursuit of a central question that animates the faith and its search for understanding, namely, what is life worth living? It's a kind of alternative way of posing a question, what must I do to be saved, right? <laughs> That's at the heart of things. One way to think about the Christian faith, and the same is true of all major world religions, is that it is an account of self, social relations, and the good in the context of an overarching interpretation of life. This way of putting the main concern of the Christian faith has the advantage of explaining the centrality of the question of meaning of life and why Christian faith might be a contributor to restoring the exploration of this question in the humanities. Now that's a very bold thesis. I want to suggest that Christian faith, other faiths as well, can actually retrieve that question for the universities, question of what makes life worth living. Now Kronman, my very good friend, He's an atheist, um, and he thinks that humanity should save us from religion. <laughs> religion can't help humanities. <laughs> he gives two reasons. The two, his two main reasons why religion can't help humanities, why Christian faith can't help humanities, is first, that no religion can be pluralist in the deep and final sense that secular humanism is pluralist. That's the, his first reason. And the second, Every religion, at some point, demands a sacrifice of the intellect. Now, those are two major uh, critiques of the Christian faith of religion in general. Right? And I'm not sure that this is time now to engage head on this critique that he provides. Uh, my suggestion uh, is that religions, faiths themselves, are often internally pluralistic. My question is whether Tony actually has encountered the full plural pluralism that exists within each of the faiths, right? And the kinds of vigorous debates that are going, going on. So in many ways, uh, faiths um, are inhabited by pluralism and can themselves be very much pluralistic, even if they're pluralistic, in a contestation, right? They're not, for the most part, a kind of um, uh, indifferent um, affirmers of pluralism, and often not pluralism as the really the, the good that we need to uh, need to affirm. They live and adjust themselves to pluralistic situation. Pluralistic pluralism often for faith is not a positive good, but at the same time, it's something that faiths know how to live with. I think more importantly, I want to suggest, and I've written recently about this, is even exclusivist religions, and many of the great faiths are exclusivist. For instance, you shall have no god, no other god. How would you call it anything else but exclusivism, right? And that's the first command. Islam. There's no God but God. You can go through various other faiths and you have exclusivism very often, very deep close to faith. We know different ways about dealing with exclusivism. But let's assume that faiths are, in some ways, or that majority of believers are exclusivistic. That doesn't necessarily mean that they can't affirm pluralism as a political project. One of the most interesting debates that I've had, public debates, with my co-teacher uh, in the course Faith and Globalization, Tony Blair, was around this question. His sense was that in order to have a political pluralism, you have to have a kind of religious pluralism as well. So that religious pluralism, saying that all faiths are roughly equal in their ability to connect us with ultimate reality and to foster a good life, that kind of religious pluralism that goes hand in hand and has affinity with pluralism as a political project. And my response was, well, that may be the case. But that doesn't follow 
that people who are religious exclusivists therefore must be political exclusivists as well. In fact, the origin of political pluralism, as far as I could tell, is among highly exclusivist religious sects. First Baptists, for instance, were political pluralists because they advocated more strenuously than just about anybody else freedom of religion. And freedom of religion meant for them freedom, Thomas Helvis is the person I'm speaking about, meant for them freedom for not just of different Christian sects, but for Jews, for Muslims, for atheists. They're more liberal than Locke was. <laughs> right. So was also Roger Williams in the United States, a sturdy religious exclusivist who, who just because he was exclusivist was also political pluralist, not just political pluralist in theory, but political pluralist also in establishing institutions which would guarantee freedom of religion and therefore possibility of political pluralism. So this is my, maybe a little footnote of my argument, but with Tony uh, Kronman. It is possible that religious faiths, just because they are what they are, often exclusivistic, will support pluralism as a political project. That leaves the question unanswered, right? Which one is the correct position, religious exclusivism or religious pluralism? It just sketches the fact that even when religious people are religious exclusivists, they can advocate pluralism as a political project. Now, as to the claim that Christian faith, that any religion always at the bottom involves sacrificing uh, kind of an intellect and some point of reasoning stops and faith starts, well, I think that's just about true for everyone. <laughs> and some point, reasoning stops, <laughs> right? And some things are taken, so to say. Faith is, I think, more fundamental than reason. But we can discuss that maybe at some later point. There, there are people here who work on these issues uh, much more than I do, and maybe we can have that as our important conversation. Now, if I see one obstacle, for instance, of the Christian faith serving as a source of rejuvenate, to rejuvenate the question, quest for life worth living, um, that lies not so much in absence of pluralistic inclinations or in a kind of certain form of incipient fundamentalism. I think it lies in especially recent practices of the Christians themselves. And these practices have to do with the way in which we as Christians conceive our own faith. For many Christians in the West, faith has become a preference. Not much more than preference. There are many ways in which one can illustrate this. Uh, Chris Smith from, no from Notre Dame uh, has done some work on uh, what um, adolescents and then early college uh, year, especially evangelical Christians, how they think of God. And the phrase that he uses is um, that, divine, that God is like a heavenly butler for them. Everybody needs a butler, don't you think so? <laughs> and if it's divine butler, that's so much better. <laughs> but the basic idea is God is here, kind of benevolent being at the service of your desires. I sometimes think that we use 
God as a performance-enhancing drug. And you see, it's, it's kind of a cup of coffee for <laughs> in the morning. Prayer and a cup of coffee, they kind of merge <laughs> into one. Often in situations, we're fragile human beings, right? And often in situations of fragility, difficulty, uh, where success is in, in doubt, uh, we resort to prayer. We seek somehow God's sustenance in this situation. Or faith functions for us as kind of divine band-aid. We go through life, we get harmed, we are bruised, and we need somehow healing. We need kind of redemptive touch of God so as to put us back on the course so that we can continue in what we have started to work on. So performance to enhance our um, activities, a divine band-aid in order to patch us up when things aren't quite right. But you see, this is all about our goals and God's service to those goals. It's, in sociological language, functionalizing of religion. And religion is functionalized with regard to our own ends. We set the ends, and religion serves in order to support them. That's the point of divine butler, right? First floor folks and second floor folks, not the a, not a basement folks, decide what's going to happen. The goal, of the, the purpose of the, of the basement folks is to make it happen. <laughs> but if Christian faith is about ends and goals, <laughs> and not about means. It's only then that Christian faith can serve to revive what's lacking in humanities. We conceive of Christian faith as a kind of an alternative means <laughs> to achieve the same ends. But it can't be that. It can be competition. Who can achieve better ends? Either science or Christian faith. When I was teaching this course on, uh, on faith and globalization, I had a colleague of mine join me who was teaching with me. He was in, uh, he was in other, other discipline, and uh, he wasn't always quite sure what to do with this faith business. And, uh, but, but then had a certain sense of how, it, how it faith functioned. And he said um, to the class, you know, I also have faith. And then he reached into his pocket, took a pill, and said, I believe that if I take this pill, I will get better. Just like a Christian believes, when they pray, they will get better. But you see what's being done? The instruments... <laughs> of achieving certain goals that are preset have been now compared. And now there's a competition between faith and science, once you put it this way, and technology. Or you can do the same kind of competitive relationship with regard to explanation of the universe. Science as an explanatory endeavor uh, stands in competition with faith in this explanatory endeavor. And so if you think that the purpose of faith is to explain the universe, to help you achieve your goals in it, then you're in competition with science, which explains the universe, and technology, which helps you achieve certain goals, right? And what you miss in the process of the whole thing is that faith is precisely about us having goals, set goals, goals that are set for us by the virtue of the fact that we have been created not for ourselves, but as an eccentric human beings that transcend ourselves into the divine realm. That's who we are by definition. And once you think of us in those terms, 
then faith becomes primarily about the transcendence of the human spirit and therefore about purposes of human existence and not about explanation simply or instrumental um, uh, about means for achieving certain goals. And I think, I'm afraid that increasingly we're losing the sense of genuine transcendence. And with the loss of genuine transcendence, we're losing ability also, not just to live authentic Christian faith, but also for that faith to contribute to revival of and to rejuvenation and reorientation of our universities. Let me end my comments by a little story. Uh, what happened to me? I was at one point after 9-11, um, I was doing some consulting and the consultation that I was doing was for Larry Summers. Um, you know Larry Summers for various, uh, his various uh, kind of history of his uh, uh, various uh, jobs uh, as an economist, but he was at one point also president of Harvard University. And it's in this capacity of him as president of Harvard University that he called me up one day and we were discussing about the future of Harvard Divinity School. And in the course of these conversations at one point he told me, Miroslav, you know, if Harvard were to be founded today, if Harvard were being founded today, it wouldn't have a divinity school. Now, as is often the case uh, here also, Larry Summers was proverbially blunt. <laughs> he just said what he thought and what I think not just he things, but what many other people think as well. Now, I could have responded to Larry Summers and said, you know, but look at the world in which we live. We live in the world of resurgent faiths. We live in a world in which faiths are alive. In fact, the world is becoming both in relative and absolute terms, more religious place rather than less religious place. That's counterintuitive in Canada, even in the United States, especially in Europe, but it's true if you look at the statistics. And it's not only that the that world is becoming more religious place rather than less religious place. By the way, this is primarily because of the population growth. But this now aside. But it's not only that, but that faiths are becoming more and more politically assertive. Now, I could have said to Larry, look, at this is the case. And 9-11 gives you one of the consequences of what happens when you have a growing, vital, assertive faiths that live under the same roof and they clash. The goal, our goal should be to increase understanding of faiths, understanding of this world of faiths. But had I said that to Larry Summers, would I have said enough? We can study religions sociologically. We can study religions psychologically, psychosociologically. We can study religions in multiplicity of ways. In fact, all other disciplines can, many other disciplines can study religion without any need for religious studies departments or divinity schools. His response to me could have been, well, fine, we'll study it in sociology, we'll study it in all this, in psychology, faculty of psychology. No need for either religious studies, certainly no need for the divinity school. I tried to persuade Larry Summers that in fact, what we need is engagement, constructive engagement with religious traditions. We need to revive conversation about truth of human existence across centuries and within particular traditions. And unless we learn how to do that, 
we won't be able to converse across tradition in the political realm. And unless we do that, we also will not be enlightened about what the proper ends of human lives, human life are. Now, each one of us in pluralistic, each group in our pluralistic environment will have their own ideas about what those ends are. But it's exactly an invitation for a careful discussion of this most fundamental of all questions. And I think that places like Regis College, places like the Divinity School where I teach, that in many ways is our mission to the university. This is the place where most important questions that informed human life ought to be discussed. Now, as it turns out, we need to do a lot of work to persuade people that these are, in fact, the most important questions. Right? If you judge what gets airtime, if you judge what, uh, what, what gets to be discussed in public realm, these don't seem to be the most important questions to be discussed. But some of it obviously has to do with how the set of values in society are being shaped. But some of it also has to do about what we, as theologians, what we as religious folks, what we as philosophers also often do. I think some of our marginalization is self-inflicted. And it's self-inflicted because we too have taken on the kind of wissenschaftlich ideal. <laughs> ideal of humanities, in our particular case of faith, as quote-unquote science. Now, I have nothing against historical, sociological, and all multiple other uh, linguistic and so forth study of the texts in their environments and so forth. But my sense is that if we limit our study to this, if that becomes the primary purpose of our endeavor, that we will lose the heart of our endeavor. At one point, controversially, I think, and maybe here I'll get resistances too, I have said if we study simply biblical texts in the context of their time, it's a study in exotic plants. These texts are important because they're important to people today, not because they're particularly significant texts from the past. I can think of more important texts than, than biblical texts. They're significant because they're alive, because they shape culture today, because they engage people's imagination and shape their lives. And I think they have to be studied in such way. So there's a kind of retrieval that needs to happen within the Christian faith, how we conceptualize live Christian faith. There's kind of retrieval that needs to happen in how theological studies are done as well. And once that has began to happen, I think we have an important contribution to make. You know, I'll end with this. At one point early in the book, uh, Tony has, uh, Kronman has spoken about how universities have lost interest in the meaning of life. And he said, he wrote, if you want to go find institutions which are devoted to this question. He said, you got to go to good churches. That's an atheist speaking. Now, I wanted to tell him, Tony, when have you been last time to church? <laughs> it would be great <laughs> if you were right. <laughs> But there's kind of intuition that he has, right? That there are institutions that are dedicated to this, this question, even though we often don't do it really well. And he begins his story with Harvard at the beginning uh, of Harvard's history, where theological studies were organized around this 
fundamental question. And so I think we do have resources. And I'm hoping that with my, I will contribute just a tiny bit to this by teaching this course at Yale on life worth living. It'll be taught in a pluralistic way. We'll study Buddha. We'll study Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, John Stuart Mill, and Nietzsche. And we'll have students read original texts. I won't describe you the whole course, but some of it. We'll have students read the original texts and then ask at least four, these four questions. According to this teacher, as expressed in this text, what does it mean to lead one's life well? What does it mean for life to go well for one? You know the difference between leading life well and life going well? Life going well, what happens to you? Right? Life leading, your leading life well is what you do in order to direct your life. One is your own responsibility, the other one you're an you're, you're active agent, the other one you're, you're a patient, you're passive. Right? And both of them form <laughs> our components of our life, right? What does it mean to lead one's life well? What does it mean for life to go well? What motivations are there to lead one's life well? And for this vision of what it means for life to go well, and what happens when you fail? How do you repair <laughs> what fails? Hopefully, we can revive the discussion about these incredibly important questions. Everywhere I go and speak about this issue, people tell me, wow, this is really important, but how do we do that? <laughs> and that's what I leave you with. This is really important. I sense that you believe me <laughs> and agree, but how do we do it well? That's our challenge. Thank you very much.